You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. You hear it every day. People struggling to understand the significance of computers, the web, dot com, the new economy. Some people look back to the Industrial Revolution for something with a similar power to transform the economy and social relationships. But the historical pref reference that I personally find most helpful is the introduction of electricity in the 1880s. In 1888, Cincinnatians wrote glowingly about the marvels of the electric light bulbs put up specially for the city's centennial exposition. But no one in 1888 could even begin to formulate images of factories without steam boilers, a refrigerator, a toaster, a phone, a radio, or a television, all made possible by something they couldn't see. In the first decades of the electrical age, entrepreneurs strung wires everywhere, creating an ugly, sparking canopy over the city street. But soon, the Chamber of Commerce began helping local businesses learn about what was happening in other cities, and the city government organized a new electrical department. You haven't heard that one before, have you? Just six years after the opening of the World Wide Web, we are in a very similar position to Cincinnatians in 1888. And that may be the best way to understand fast break into the new economy, an initiative launched by the Greater Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce, the city of Cincinnati, and the entrepreneurs in the so-called digital frontier. Several weeks ago, 12 News anchor Dana Eubanks prepared a report on this effort. Cincinnati's Over the Rhine District, once home to German immigrants, is now home to so-called digital immigrants. There are now 73 dot-com and high-tech businesses within a 30-block radius called the Digital Rhine Corridor. Companies like Planet Feedback, launched by a former Procter & Gamble employee in February, Planet Feedback now has more than 40 employees and over $30 million in backing. What we intend to do is provide a megaphone for consumers to have their voice heard more clearly by companies and help companies to respond directly to consumers. But while Planet Feedback is growing rapidly, some may question why Cincinnati should try to be a dot-com haven when many dot-coms are failing. The reality is that there's a huge amount of value creation taking place in the digital economy, and it's critical that Cincinnati owns a piece of that growth. Dan Meyer is the president and CEO of Geoge, a dot-com founded by another former Procter & Gamble employee, Tim Martin. And we provide business-to-business -business software to Internet portals. Meyer says the environment of Over the Rhine is actually key to pulling in technology talent. The availability and affordability of facilities, facilities that are flexible for expansion, cultural opportunities that uh, the new economy talent likes to take advantage of. Cincinnati the mission is to get others to see Cincinnati as part of a new digital frontier. If you go to San Francisco, you've got to shell out two million bucks to live in a to live in a garage. Out here, you can live, um, you know, you can have a very high quality of life uh, at, you know, a fraction of that cost, and that's a big plus when you're trying to recruit um, A-plus talent. Pushing that winning image is now the job of the new economy project team in hopes of making the digital Rhine the newest Silicon Valley. Dana Eubanks, 12 News. I am now joined by two people behind the fast break effort who are trying to stir investments in the new economy here in Cincinnati. Jonathan Hollifield is the vice president of the new economy enterprise for New Economy Enterprise for the Greater Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce, a new position, by the way. Dan Meyer is the president and chief executive officer of Giage in, Incorporated, an internet software company in, digital Orion, in the digital Rhine, and we just met Dan on that tape. Both of you, welcome to Newsmakers. Jonathan, welcome uh, back. Thanks, you just Jim. keep wearing different hats. Absolutely. I just keep <laughs> having you back. I don't understand it. Anyway, new economy. What is that umbrella? Is it dot coms? Is it software? Is it what is it, Jonathan? Well, we have the uh, opportunity to define what the new economy means for Greater Cincinnati, and to leverage upon the assets that we already have, which includes an emerging dot com community, a substantial IT and software development community, a substantial infrastructure to support life sciences, advanced manufacturing and materials and of course a terrific telecommunications infrastructure. For me, that is the new economy and leveraging those existing assets and building upon them for the future defines uh, uh, who we are. You know, some of those go all the way from uh, uh, small little companies on Main Street to huge corporations uh, uh, 
that's been spun off by Cincinnati Bell mm -hmm. and you know all sorts of things. What is it that ties all those together? Though? You know, that, that really gets to the definition of what is the new economy, because I think that's an often misunderstood term. Uh, our definition is that it is the economy. Mm -hmm. now, I, I really think the question is more, how would you characterize today's economy and how has that evolved really over the last several years, both locally at a state level, federal level, and internationally? And we look at the, the new economy has characteristics of being really a knowledge-based mm -hmm. uh, economy. Uh, the individual workers in this economy, in fact, statistics say that 80% of them are in jobs where they're no longer making things. They're really producing and working with information and knowledge. And that's really a shift from the manufacturing base uh, of the past. Very much a shift from the base of this city, which uh, in particular, and the way, and yeah. the way we've right. done things. You know, on the one hand, Jonathan, you were saying there's this great spread mm -hmm. of different assets. Right. Dan, you were saying there, here's the common thread. Mm -hmm. My understanding in other places that have made the new economy work in a, in a vigorous way is there has to also be some focus, some concentration. Absolutely. You know, whether it's software development or, you know, I hear about Dublin, Ireland being a call center mm -hmm. or Southeast Asia being multimedia and people just driving one image. Is that what we have to do out of this fast break? Uh, study process, figure out what we're going to drive in this city? I think we do have to define what we want to be. And examining the existing economic base, we're very fortunate to already have a diverse uh, uh, economy. And mm -hmm. leveraging those assets and defining what they will be in this century is part of our uh, task. Uh, we will not have the definitive answer, but we want to be a catalyst for a wider community discussion, business discussion, political discussion, defining the region that is Greater Cincinnati. You know, Dan, one of the things that, that uh, I don't know, as a historian, I'm always <laughs> leery about is if you just stick in one city, you can focus. We can do stories about Main Street, and we can do stories about UC and its biotech stuff, and it all sounds great. But you, how would you evaluate where Cincinnati stands relative to other places, the Silicon Valley, uh, uh, the Beltway around 128 <coughs> around Boston, mm -hmm. Seattle. Right. How do we stack up uh, uh, in relationship to those other places? Sure. Yeah, I actually have an interesting perspective on that because uh, prior to moving back to Cincinnati, I'm a Cincinnati native. I moved back here in 1996. I was in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area for eight years and uh, went to graduate school out there and worked out there uh, for many different companies. Uh, I'd say we're on the move. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got momentum, and that's what's exciting. Uh, some of these other places, you could say, are almost at a saturation point. You know, they're, they're starting to see some of the uh, some of the ails uh, of uh, growth. You know, uh, high cost of living, uh, lack of office space, uh, lower quality of life. Uh, people are actually moving out of areas like the San Francisco Bay Area or even Boston, uh, looking for uh, a better balance. Uh, and I think uh, really the, the generations today that represent so much of the new economy's talent. That is a high priority for them, is that balance. So mm -hmm. where do we stack up? I think that uh, we've got a lot of growth ahead of us. We've got a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Um, but I, I really look at it as onward and upward. Let, let me throw out a little challenging view. I have, mm -hmm. I have actually, it's the sons of very good friends of ours. Nobody my age mm -hmm. is in the center of this stuff. Uh, the sons of very good friends of ours created a uh, software company in Minneapolis, Minnesota. When they got to the second round of venture capital investment, they were told, couldn't stay in Minneapolis, had to move either to Seattle or to Boston. They chose Boston because they couldn't get the skilled workforce. Is, and they now got 500 people working for them and they're 29 years old, it makes me sick. Right. Uh, <laughs> but the, 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 the point here is, does Cincinnati have the workforce? Do we have the material? Can we start things and then they have to move in order to grow? No, absolutely not. I mean, in fact, uh, the, the, the data is already there. I mean, we're already looking at an emergence of dozens of so-called dot-coms, even in the downtown Digital Rhine Corridor. You know, a recent uh, survey by the Main Street Ventures Group found over 70 dot-coms in a 15-square block area. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's a very good environment for that. In fact, uh, our company, GI, is a good example of that. We were founded here by two former Procter & Gamble executives. We're now at 40 employees. We received a $5 million round of venture funding in March of this year. Local uh, and, venture funds? And all of that, yes. We have three institutional investors. How many and employees? All those locally. Uh, Forty total employees. Do you company. have trouble finding skilled employees? Well, you know, it really depends on uh, the skill set. 
Uh, I would say no, in general, we haven't had a lot of trouble finding employees, uh, which may strike other people in the community as, as being funny, because that's obviously a, a very hot topic now, right. particularly for small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we look to create an environment that uh, the new economy talent types thrive in. Uh, and uh, I would say you know, we really have not struggled with that. And we've pulled people from outside the community, too, mm -hmm. not sure. just from Cincinnati. And, and Dan, that is a legitimate challenge to our region. Uh, many of the emerging uh, 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 businesses in this tech space have been challenged similarly, yet they have been successful, much like GIs, Planet Feedback, Synchrony. Uh, they have been su uh, successful raising significant capital, and yet they have resisted the demands or requests to relocate because they believe in Greater Cincinnati, believe there's an opportunity for tremendous growth opportunity and wealth creation right here with an outstanding quality of life. Well, this fast, uh, fast Break Project, which is a 10-week study, a very intensive sort of uh, proposal, the things that you have to focus on in that, what are the main areas? Is venture capital one of them? Absolutely. Uh, we have carved out four general areas, and our rigorous process of determining what will come out of this project will center around those areas. They include talent. Both the so that's that's the absolutely all right. Your question there. The supply and the demand for talent, capital, uh, venture capital, quasi-public funds with a public purpose, those sorts of discussions, infrastructure, high-speed internet uh, access, uh, fiber optics, uh, and the final area is promotion. There you go. Which is a very important one, which is promoting what we already are doing and the momentum that we already have. Convincing people it's there, making people aware it's there? Well, mm -hmm. we've experienced it. You know, our company, GIOSH, has experienced it. Uh, we're benefiting from the environment. Mm -hmm. We've attracted local capital. We've hired the talent. We have a terrific team of people. So I think the, the variables are all there. One of the arguments in, about other places, too, is that one of the keys is a very good research university yeah. that's spinning yeah, ideas true. out, spinning uh, patents out, you know, MIT in Boston, uh, Stanford out in, in uh, the West, and the Business Courier a couple months ago raised a very hard set of articles saying UC wasn't up to the task here, that what we're, one of the big holes that we're lacking is a research university that has the strength to do what other places are doing. That wasn't on your list. <laughs> well, we look at UC perhaps a little a bit differently. Uh, we believe in the local university. We believe in our super region, which extends to Indianapolis, Columbus, includes Dayton, Lexington, Louisville, Huntington, West Virginia, that there's a tremendous opportunity for distinction there. And our local universities, including University of Cincinnati, Xavier, Northern Kentucky, and Miami, all within perhaps a 60-mile radius or so, are outstanding, are, is an outstanding core of university talent, and I will take those four against any four throughout our super region. I, I think there's a real opportunity mm -hmm. here to better integrate the university's initiatives and mm -hmm. projects and ideas with some of the other uh, really components of the new economy, and that's something that we're looking at in this right. project, because there are actually many examples of companies that have been spawned off UC, and if you actually look at the BioStar Incubator, which is affiliated with the University of Cincinnati, um, the president of that is on our new economy project team. The company I used to work with, SDRC, was founded by uh, professors out of the University of Cincinnati. A long time ago. It, it was in, 30 in, plus years ago. Right. That's and in, right. Yeah, in the computer world, that's an ancient company. Sure it is. <laughs> that yeah. has survived lots of ups and downs, but is on a very much an upswing at the moment. So there are definitely examples, and I think there's an, a real opportunity to create a more seamless environment uh, between the university's initiatives. I would say that uh, Many of the members of our new economy project team, which is uh, a reflection of the community at large, were very pleasantly surprised by so many initiatives that uh, are actually going on at the university as we learn about them. You know, one of the things that you mentioned before, and we're, I'm aware of time right now, infrastructure, uh, fiber optics. Where do we stand on infrastructure? Is that, are we, are we behind? Do we need to do a lot? Are we in pretty good shape? Where do we stand? We must look at that in its proper perspective. Right now, we are the most wired city in the, in the state of Ohio, one of the most wired cities in the United States. But quite frankly, with the physical aspect of infrastructure, other communities will catch up. 
ultimately we believe it will be the talent base that Dan talked about that mm -hmm. will be the distinguishing quality. Okay, one of the key things on this group that you've put together for the new economy is that there are two city council people, one a Democrat, Alicia Reese, one a Republican, Pat DeWine, right. and we saw Charlie Lucan out there when you kick this thing off. Charlie's always out there when you kick yeah. things off. <laughs> uh, but what do you expect from the city? What are you going to be asking the city to do? Well, we think it's very important that throughout this entire process, the city is heavily involved. In fact, John Shirey, city manager, joined us just this past Tuesday for our entire project team meeting, which was one of our best sessions. Um, we think it's important that we don't develop recommendations and look at these things in any sort of vacuum with respect to the city's priorities, resources, or perspectives. So we've designed this project so that we build in not only two city council members, but they're actually two uh, people from the city administration that the city manager assigned, they are part of our project team as well. One final question. Why the city, if anything ought to be regional, it seems to me it's the new economy. Why the city? Well, the city is the starting point uh, because of its form of government and the flexibility, as you well know, within the charter form of government, the city really has an opportunity to lead the region unlike any other municipality or county government. Very good. Nice, right. nice Chamber of Commerce <laughs> answer. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. I, uh, if people out there want to learn uh, more about the Fast Break Initiative or offer comments and feedback, you can log on to the website at www.marchfirstcincinnati.com slash fastbreak. I've been on the site. Great site. It's a really good thing. Thank you for being, being here. Thank you. And uh, we'll have you back. All right. Okay. <laughs> now stay tuned. School's about to start. After the break, some information about a very focused and very effective volunteer program to help children learn to read. Stay tuned for details. Does mentoring really improve student learning? At Euler's school in Lower Price Hill it does. Governor Taft just recognized Euler as the most improved reading school in Ohio. Welcome back. Last year, 40% of Ohio's fourth grade students did not pass the reading portion of the Ohio proficiency test. Beginning next year, any student who does not pass the fourth grade reading test will not be promoted to the fifth grade. The personal, educational, and institutional implications of that situation are potentially catastrophic. Over the past decade, thousands of Cincinnatians have volunteered as mentors to help students. But not all mentoring programs are the same. Some invite the mentor to become involved with every aspect of a student's life, sort of like a big brother's or big sister's program. Others concentrate on tutoring students in basic skills. The HOST program, which stands for Help One Student to Succeed, is one of the latter types. The program has been in operation at Euler's School in Lower Price Hill for five years and has now spread to six other Cincinnati public schools. If you are interested in helping a child improve their reading, writing, and study skills, the beginning of the school year is the time to get involved. To discuss the host program, I am joined by two people. Mary O'Dwyer is a longtime teacher in the Cincinnati public schools who retired at the end of last year, but is returning to Euler this year to help coordinate the host program. Al Hampton is a mentor in the host program and will be returning for his sixth year as a volunteer. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary, um, Bob Taft recognized Euler back in May for its significant improvement as the best school in the state for improving. How, did, how much did you improve? How, what kind of numbers can we say? What kind of measurable improvement can we show? What we know, uh, Dan, is that the students uh, get, went from 4% to, I think it was like 40% or a little over 40% wow. of the fourth graders passing the reading portion of the fourth grade proficiency test. That was just an incredible gain. And, um, and that's in a one-year that jump? That's a one-year jump? That was a one-year jump. What we really do feel at Euler, uh, Dan, is that we're, everybody is working to help the children uh, perform as smart as they are. They are beautiful, smart kids. Uh, if they can show it, that's wonderful. And one of the ways, um, there are many components, more parent involvement, 
um, uh, the staff, as the staff were getting smarter about what to do. But a huge piece of it is um, the the one-on-one. -on -one. There is no substitute for one-on-one -on -one and making sure that children do that half hour reading every day because research tells us that's what it takes to improve reading is to read. And that, I'm going to turn to Al here, but that, that's a wonderful image, letting kids reveal themselves for as smart as they really are. I really yeah. love that image. Yeah. Uh, now, you've been a volunteer in this program at Euler for five years already, going into your six. Is that right? Correct. Tell us, in a concrete way, what is it that you do? What, what, if some of us become involved in this, what will that be? What do you actually do? Well, the number one thing that I think is necessary is to meet the youngster, relate to that youngster, and make sure the youngster has confidence in you. Uh, then you evaluate to see where he is and where you can start, because you must start where the youngster is. We are fortunate to have two people who give us a lot of guidance on how to start with the kids, but it's still important for the mentor to know the youngster and start where, where he is. On any one day, how much time do you spend with a child? Approximately 25 minutes. Okay. So this is pretty concentrated. Yes. And then how many times a week do you? I do it twice a week, okay. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I worked uh, in the past two years with three kids on those two days. Okay. So you're, you're spending uh, more time than just that 25 minutes because you have three different students. Or do you have all three at the same time? No. It's a one-to-one -one program, so I work one youngster at a time. Mary, uh, I think of myself as a pretty successful high school and college teacher, but the idea of teaching reading to uh, first, second, third grade scares the heck out of me. If you volunteer for this program, does the volunteer get some real instruction about how to help mm -hmm. the students so you're not just there bumbling around? Well, and um, thank you, Dan. I, I have done reading with children all my life, and there's really two parts to it. There is the whole skill, and that's the job of the teacher, is making sure that children have been taught the pieces of the reading writing process. But as you know, many children don't get it the first time, the second time, and there are many, many children who, do, uh, who need the one-on-one, -on -one, and to make absolutely certain that the reading, that one-on-one -on -one comfortable reading that you have done as a parent. Right. Really, in a way, what mentors are often doing is extending the role of the parent uh, with the child in making sure that that reading happens every day, that it's enjoyable, that it's connected to life, that there's a whole variety of reading. That's what the mentor is doing. It's one-on-one -on -one undivided attention around the enjoyment of literature and learning skills from what they have read together. How in that with the students that you were working with, could you really see, say, from September when you start until May, maybe when the school year is winding up, could you really see improvement? You can see improvement without doubt. It's, and it's very inspiring and it's very motivating to see the growth that youngsters do make. Uh, one of the advantages of a one-to-one, -one, uh, no other one, uh, no one else in the room, a youngster can make mistakes, mm -hmm. and which I think is that's that's the way people do learn. Right. There's nobody laughing at him. There's no one uh, saying, "Oh, that's uh, wrong," you, because you're not a teacher, uh, you're not an authority person. You are not only the mentor, but you also are their friend. And I think with that, kids, I think, are able to express themselves. And I think learning becomes easier. Mary, I'm aware of time right now. How many mentors do you have right now, and how many more do you need at Euler? And then we can talk about the system. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, when you ask mentors, I'm thinking we have 100 students. We want to give them four half hours a week. We are talking about 400 half hours. Wow. Uh, we probably have covered 200 of those half hours <coughs> right now. So if we can get another 200. And then I didn't fully answer your last question. Well, I'm, I know there's there a is lot of questions. There is training. There is training. We're going to point this out. If you're interested, by the way, in uh, volunteering for the host program and you want information,
call Euler School at 244-3000. Training for mentors will be held on September 5th and 6th. That's what Mary was going to say. So now's the time to call. If you're interested in becoming a mentor at one of the host programs in the other Cincinnati Public Schools, call 475-7000, which is the general number. Thank you very much. Good luck. Al, congratulations. You're doing something important for all of us, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men shaping our region for the future. Have a good week.